Climate change is the big threat, according to Joe Biden, far more so than, you know, nuclear war. Climate change is the big threat. Here's Tulsi Gabbard telling us about that. The problem is he's insane. Only a madman would not consider a nuclear holocaust, a nuclear war, as an existential threat. He said, quote, the only existential threat to humanity is climate change. <laughs> what did you okay. make of that one, James? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, I mean, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll expand NATO up to the ozone layer. I don't you know. know what? <laughs> I don't think this is going to happen, but there has been all sorts of chatter about Tulsi being Trump's I being. know. Not I love that story. Be, which be which I don't think is going to happen, but... What a turn up for the books that would be. Someone who was a Democrat presidential candidate. It's the you sort saw of thing there. Trump would do. She destroyed Absolutely. Kamala. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, and then she saw the parties completely unhinged these days, so she left. And if she becomes a Republican that, that VP... That would be... Wow. That's the big existential threat to <laughs> the <Yeah>. Democrat Party. <laughs> That would be the existential threat to the Democrat Party. That is absolutely true. I believe with Tulsi as a VP, it would be an utter landslide because she would pull serious independent and Democrat voters who remember her somewhat as a Democrat candidate. I don't think that would be an overstatement. I think that would be the landslide of landslides in the recent past. Not sure, but hey, we have a great video with Tulsi talking to Michael Frenzis. And I wanted to highlight a couple of things that she said. I think they're very important as her name continues to circle around the VP. And like they said, there is more and more chatter. I'm hearing it everywhere I go that the unspoken thing, because Trump has always talked about he knew who his VP was. And the unspoken thing has always been that Tulsi was never mentioned among all the shortlisters, that all the media pundits threw out there. And it could be very well be that that is Trump's secret weapon. Let's dive in. What they're doing to Donald Trump, it's not really about Trump. It's, it's about what they're taking away from the American people, the right of choice. You're they right. really want to destroy this man. And I've never seen, you know, such a vendetta against anyone in my lifetime. And Tulsi, I'll tell you this. I, you know, I try not to be a, a hateful person. You know, I am a person of faith, but I have such horrible feelings for Joe Biden because some of, he's, he's not only destroying our country, but he's causing chaos throughout the world. I've been in the United Kingdom for the past two weeks. The way people are talking about America now, it's an embarrassment. I mean, everybody I speak to, Michael, what's going on in your country? It's embarrassing. What is going on? You know, I think a lot of, as America goes, the rest of the world goes, certainly here in the United Kingdom. And it's just, people have to recognize this. They have to. This is such yeah. destruction going on. He's absolutely right about that. Remember the, the old adage that if America sneezes, Europe gets the flu. It's been said many different ways. If America sneezes, America cough, Europe gets a cold, blah, blah, blah. But the idea is that the United States is the linchpin of the free Western world. It is the linchpin of the free world in general, because for the longest time, the US led the West and we were the only bastion of freedom out there. Everybody else was some level of authoritarian. And, but now we see this shift happening where the old guard European monarchies through their surrogates are trying to reclaim authoritarian power in the West. And they're doing it with nonsense like climate change, with nonsense like wokeism, with nonsense like the LBGTQ agenda, where they silence free speech, where they destroy people, where they s balkanize and, and divide the, the people within a country against each other so that they can't see the scam that the elitists in the government are pulling. All of the Western nations now have some semblance of rule or influence by this globalist cabal of corruptocrats that are, again, linked back to the old European monarchies that are trying to reformulate authoritarian power. Michael Franzess is absolutely correct. What's going on in our country is a disgrace. The fact that they have covered up Joe Biden's mental illness for four years, what is clearly now either, I mean, according to a lot of doctors from the surface, it's clearly Parkinson's. But whether it's Parkinson's or it's Alzheimer's or it's dementia, he's clearly mentally addled. He's oatmeal brains and he cannot do the job, but they've covered that up. And as such, they have wrought destruction in the United States. Now, we still have a chance to pull it back from the brink. 
But if the United States goes, think about what happens to Britain and France and the Scandinavian democracies. Europe will fall, will teeter and fall like dominoes because there, there is no U.S. There is no bastion of real freedom. Everything else will eventually go away and it will descend into some level of authoritarianism. He's absolutely right, which is why this election is so important, which is why Trump, the number one pick that he makes is VP. And that's in order to get elected. Once he's elected, the number one pick, the number two people that he has to choose are chief of staff. He's got to get that right. And he's got to get attorney general right. But the first thing he's got to do is pick the right VP to help him get over the line. Tulsi would not be a bad pick from that perspective. Now, I have some concerns about would she govern as a true conservative, given the fact that she was going to vote for Bernie Sanders four years ago and then voted for Biden four years ago. So there's some serious concerns there. But in order of, in terms of helping him get elected, oh, she would probably be the number one choice. It's, it's you know, I, I try to I try to refocus the conversation here at home away from, uh, you know, the superficial distractions back to the fundamentals. You know, there, there, there's a whole generation of young people who didn't learn about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the origins and the founding of our country as they grew up through going through a K through 12 public schools. They haven't learned in a really meaningful way. What does it mean to be an American? What kind of responsibility comes with being a citizen of this country? Why was it so important to our founding fathers to ensure that the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights has to do with freedom? freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of religion. Because of that, we're in a place. She's absolutely right. The founders enshrined freedom of speech and freedom of religion as Amendment 1 and then backed it up with Amendment 2 that said, if anybody tries to take away Amendment 1, you've got the means to defend yourself and to defend the people around you from the government. But what she said about the education system, I want you to check out, if you don't know anything about it, you got to check out Antonio Gramsci and the Frankfurt School. Antonio Gramsci was a Marxist Soviet who came over, I think he came from uh, Italy. But anyway, he was a Marxist who studied in the First World War, why did the proletariat, the workers, rise up and fight for their monarch nations? Why did they fight for their kings and queens? Why did they go to war and die when they should have cast all that off in this grand Soviet communist revolution? And what he said is he realized that it was the institutions that were the glue of society. The institutions being the church, the family, the school, the arts, entertainment. Everything revolved around this idea of family first. That forms the core of a, of a society, of a community. That forms the core of a nation. And those were undergirded by religion, specifically in the West by Christianity. And so he proposed that the only way to topple Western countries was by going through a long march through the institutions. And that's what they've been doing for the last hundred years. They have been on a long march through the institutions, destroying our education system, destroying our entertainment, corrupting everything they, they, they touch. It's just why now you see in the last 20 years, you see, and, and that all came through Gromsky and through the Frankfurt School, which was a bunch of communists that were imported into the United States and formed the Frankfurt School, which started to churn out a lot of this intellectual thought that went into academia and education. And that's why now you see this focus on the 1619 Project, the balkanization of America into little Marxist divided groups. That's why you see the failure of our education system to teach anything about the greatness of America, the uniqueness of America, the fact that everybody is free in America. That's why you see him pointing back to 200 years ago oppression of black Americans, which was absolutely horrific and wrong. But that ended in the 60s. That's why you see this entire push towards the alphabet mafia and LGBTQ nonsense and balkanizing America now around that. They, will, they want to divide America around anything they can and get us fighting each other so that we can't see that the government is taking away our rights and that we are descending into authoritarian tyranny. She's 100% correct. Now where there, there's a lot of people in our country who don't know what it means to be an American right. anymore. Mm -hmm. 
And they, they don't value these freedoms that so many, my brothers and sisters in uniform over generations have sacrificed their lives to support and defend. And they don't understand, and you, you made mention of this, that, that what's happening right now is this is not about Donald Trump. And it's not really even about Joe Biden at all. He's the guy who happens to be there. And yes, he is the president of the United States and he wants to continue in that job. But when you look at the levers of power, they are so much bigger than Joe Biden. And, and their goal is to take away our freedom, to consolidate their power. The short-sightedness of this is that as they openly talk about and advocate for and, and are trying to censor our speech, limit individuals' ability to express themselves, um, once, once the levers of power change, as they always do, shift from one direction to another, What's to stop, once this precedent has been set, what's to stop the other political opponents, once they get into power, from flipping the script and turning the tables and now censoring the very people who are censoring us mm -hmm. today? It's inevitable. And this is the whole point. I, I was in a conversation last night with uh, some folks in Washington, D.C. about foreign policy and, and free speech. The issue of free speech came up because very often, as you know, Michael, the the, the excuse of, of national security to take away our free speech, to take away our liberty, is one of the most effective and most often used. We have to be uh, absolute defenders of free speech, not only for those we agree with or when it's popular or convenient, but maybe even more so, and especially for those voices who, may, who we may vehemently disagree with, whose speech we may find to be offensive and abhorrent, we have to stand up for that free speech in both of those scenarios, because inevitably, whether it's tomorrow or next week or next year or in 10 years, if we don't do that collectively, it is our speech that will be censored and our voices that will be silenced. Yeah, absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Joe Biden is a problem. He is not the problem. Now, if we speak from a spiritual sense, obviously the problem is Satan, the adversary. But if we pull it down into the political world, Joe Biden is still a problem. He's not the problem. The problem is liberalism itself, progressive liberalism, which always leads us back to authoritarian tyranny. It starts with the balkanization of a country and then leads to the eradication of freedoms. And right now we are seeing the full on assault on free speech. We must be free speech absolutists. You can say politically whatever you want to say about the regime, the administration, the Congress, your representative, whoever is in government, you have the right to say whatever you want as a private citizen about them. Political speech is 100% protected. It has to be. Otherwise, we are not allowed to think for ourselves. And so we must be free speech absolutes. For example, I find people like Ben Meislis, the Midas Touch, and David Pakman utter propagandist fools. And I despise pretty much everything they say, but they have a right to say it. Now, that'll lead us into things like media companies and you know the mainstream media and what happens when they peddle known lies. Well, we need to apply laws that are already on the books, laws against slander, defamation, liable, things like that as levers to hold media companies accountable for knowingly telling lies. And we also need to use election laws and things like that. But as private citizens, free speech, 100% absolute is free speech. We have to uphold that. Tulsi is absolutely right about that. And it's these views of hers that I love for her as a VP. It's the fact that she can pull in a whole segment of voters that Donald Trump will probably never get. He'll get on the fringes of it, but I think she could pull swaths of those voters as his VP. And as long as she continues to talk in these terms, absolutist free speech, absolutist second amendment, absolutist getting rid of the deep state and stopping the banana republicanization, if I can make up a word, of America, then I love the things that she says. I'm concerned about the liberal roots and the fact that she was going to vote for Biden just four years ago. We may have to wash through some of that, but Tulsi would be an excellent VP candidate. 
My top three, I think, are Tulsi, Byron Donalds, and my dark horse, who I would love to see, Mark Robinson, Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina. I would like to see one, one of those three as VP. Who would you like to see? Who do you think it's going to be? Who do you want it to be? Would love to hear from you. Let me know in the comments. Such great having you with me. If you've watched till this point, thank you so much. We've got a republic to save. Man, I need you all, Courageous Army, to get out there. I need you to donate. Donate to candidates of your choice. Volunteer. Become a poll watcher, a precinct worker. Get out there in the arena of ideas and fight. And finally, start accumulating your list of 10 people that you're going to drag to the polls with you and vote on or before November 5th. We do that. It's too big to rig. And if you've watched this long, thank you so much for all your support. Please smash that like button, subscribe, share this channel and this video with everybody that you know. If you want to become a bigger supporter, please consider joining us on Locals or on our YouTube membership. And finally, we're looking for 100 plus people that can do a non-monetary support. That just means you subscribe, you turn on notifications. Every time we drop a video, watch it, like it, comment on it, and share it as many times as you can. Thank you so much. If you're willing to do that, please message me in the show email. Let me know in the comments. I love all of you. Remember, God is good and he is sovereign. It'll all be good in the end. Amen. If it's not yet good, it's not yet the end. Till I catch you next time.